Everything is in motion. This is one day at a time. Everyone has cancer, and this is where I battle mine. Hey guys, and welcome to episode five, number five. Big ol' uh, uno dos tres cuatro cinco. Yeah, cinco. Yeah. Uh huh. Uh huh. Yeah, I'm smart. Episode cinco, man. Uh, of my brand new show, Everyone Has Cancer. I am Cody of the Court of Cows. Um, this is my show where I'm going to tell my story and hopefully help someone else, else out in the process. Why may you be interested in my story? Well, let me tell you. In 2001, I was diagnosed with leukemia. And then again in 2005 when I relapsed. Uh, the, the, those, these were very hard fights, but on top of that, you know, I had, uh, issues with, uh, with the family, you know, cause you know, when you get sick, you don't get sick by yourself, man. You get sick as a unit, like the whole family gets sick. Like you, you're basically the hub of a wheel. You don't become cancer, but it, it affects you and everyone around you. And for, you know, you, if you've listened this far, if you listen, listen to the other four episodes, which I think 12 people have, and 11 of them are related to me. So, yeah, what's up, guys? <laughs> but, uh, but, yeah, like, I'm going to try and, you know, make this a little bit short and sweet, you know, so I don't seem too repetitive. But here's the thing is that, we, you know, everyone has cancer <laughs> you know that, that i mean that's that's why i called the show that now you don't get worried you may not have cancer but you know it, for many years i've had people come up to me and tell me how str- strong and courageous i was because of all i've been through but you know I, I would look at them and you know they'd be like friends or family members that i know they they went through something like just as bad and they'd say well i don't know how you got through that and I'd say, well, you went through a domestic abuse. You went through uh, an addiction to drugs or, you know, or to pornography or you were raped or molested or or uh, you have suicidal thoughts. You have high ang- an anxiety disorder. You have a, you know, physical, sexual or mental abuse that you're going through. I don't know how you got through that. You know, and uh, that that's when it kind of dawned on me a long time ago that everyone has their cancer. Everyone has that one thing in their life that they're trying to get through, or they're going through, or they will go through. And what it's going to do, it's going to define them as a person. Now, that's not to say that me ha- being a leukemia patient, that didn't, I didn't, I don't, I identify with that, but that's not who I am. I'm not Cody, the guy who had cancer. Uh, I'm just Cody. I'm the guy who beat cancer. Um, and you guys can beat what you're going through. And, you know, like you may search and like I did, and we're going to talk about it here in a little bit, where you may search, scratch and claw for years, wondering why something so awful happened to you, but it passes other by the others by the wayside. And you may look for meaning in it. And, uh, you know, uh, the sad part is, is there's not always meaning in it. You know, there's not always like a, you didn't go through or are going through what you're going through because you deserve it. No one deserves anything. Deserving, in my opinion, is something that is a man-made presumption. Like uh, people decided that what they deserve is what they should get. And, you know, and that's, that's true. But I mean, it doesn't, it's random, but it's not so random. You know, and uh, it's random in the fact that it you didn't ask for it. You weren't it always it wasn't always predetermined that you were going to have to go through whatever horrible thing that you've gone through or uh, that you faced in your life, whatever nightmare you face. But when you get to the other side of it, the way you can give it meaning, as Batman said in BVS, is this world only makes sense it when we make it. So how, here's how you give it meaning is. Me, when someone says to me, you're strong and courageous for going through what you went through. Uh, To me, what I went through is laying down, throwing up and being messed up on a lot of painkillers and, uh, you know, and losing a bunch of weight and doing all that and doing a bunch of crap that I did not want to do. But I don't know where the I never saw strength and courage and just laying there crying and throwing up. Um, But. 
It's when someone looks into it. It touches their lives. It, it what your the, your attitude and your personality after the fact of all you've been through. That's what's inspiring. Not the fact that you go through it. You don't just go through something and someone says, "Oh, well, you did your time, so now you're an inspiration. Now you're a hero." You know, Batman's not a hero because his parents were killed. He was a hero because of who he became after his parents were killed. <laughs> Does that make sense? Um, but yeah, uh, so I, I would have uh, friends or family tell me, well, hey, it's nothing compared to what you went through. And I'd be like, oh, well, hey, don't don't downplay yourself and don't put me up on a pedestal. Don't make me some kind of hero because I'm not. Um, I'm, I'm just a person trying to figure out my life just like you are, you know. And uh, But when someone sees it from the outside, it gives them inspiration. It makes them feel like they can do it. If that person can do it, I can get through it too. Um, like I've said before on the show, I've had friends come up to me af- just after I've done the show that have told me that they, you know, struggle with suicidal thoughts. And, well, here's the system they have worked out at their household when they start having these thoughts. You know, all the sharp objects get locked in a safe and, you know, and then they... If when it gets really bad, they call the therapist, or you know, and or they they just have a process. Uh, people with anxiety disorders, such as myself, uh, that that's another thing. I've been through it. You know, I've gone through. You know, because of all the hospital stuff, you, sometimes you can't walk away from a bunch of hospital stuff without some kind of addiction to pain pills. Uh, I ended up with one of those. Uh, I ended up with, you know, bad relationships inside my family, and. Uh, with my father and specifically and uh you know and and it's just stuff that kind of it's a byproduct of all of it you know and i've been through all of it not to the extreme that some people have gone like at my worst uh as far as like pill addiction i was taking maybe three three to five uh oxycodones a day and some people might look at that and say wow that that's a lot but here's the thing: I never bought them off the street. They were all prescribed to me. I was able to like finagle my way because I mean that, that. I guess that was one thing good. You know, I was using my powers for evil for many, many years and saying, "Well, like I had cancer, so I can kind of get whatever I want." Uh, as far as far as medications go, like I just say, like, "Hey, ever since then, you know, this happened, and you know, it. it now I'm, you know, now I, I just I'm just stuck with." Uh, you know pains for the rest of my life and then honestly that ended up catching up to me but i'm getting really ahead of myself but but no so like i i've i've been through all that and you know some people might hear three to five pills a day that god that's a lot how how are how did you not overdose on that and some people might say uh yeah i used to take 32 i wouldn't get out of my bed for less than 28 um, I actually have a friend that I've been talking to that, uh, God, he was one of my best friends, and we'll talk about him later. And uh, I just don't want to tell anything too much about him, but, dude, he, he was, uh, he's my brother. Like, I mean, not, not, my, not my brother, but, I mean, like, you know, like, my, he was my, me and him were Batman and Robin for the longest time. Like, we were inseparable. Like, we spent every waking moment together and hung out, and it came... And you know what? I think I'll tell a little bit of that story. But we'll get there. <laughs> Again, you know, this is just setting it all up. But, uh, you know, he's got a really good story about... I, I remember a time when uh, he would not he would not get out of bed for less than, like, X amount of pills. And, uh, like, that, that... And, you know, that's his story to tell. I'm planning on having him on here. We're already talking about having him on here. But, you know, I'm going to start having guest speakers because, I mean, there, there's so many people that could add to this story. Because, again, this isn't my story. This is our story. You, if you are listening to this, this is your story. Um, and you you may even be a part of it. Because, hey, Broken Arrow is a small town. And that, that's where I grew up. That's where all this happened. It's kind of like, uh, you know, growing up in, like, a small town in, like, a horror movie. Like, once something happens, kind of like Riverdale. Like, it, you know, it takes one bad, horrible situation, and it involves everyone, and it's the talk of the town. It's, you know, maybe it's not that big of a deal, but it's the biggest they got, so it's huge, <laughs> you know? So, um, but, yeah, I'm always going to humble myself because a lot, you know, getting in there, I would see the real heroes 
which is like these little kids that are bald don't i mean not just bald they don't i mean the kids in the commercials they exist you know that like not a single hair on them and honestly uh i don't mean this in like a in like a mean-spirited way and i please, i hope you guys don't take this the wrong way but uh bald and shaped to the point of by this sickness that the only way you could tell boy from girl is the girls would have earrings or they would be in pink or something like that or you know and that's how you could tell and uh or you know you'd hear the mom call the name or you'd hear her voice and it'd be just she'd the sweetest little voice and these kids are going through the same thing I'm going through and I'm you know I'm at the time I was 16 uh in 2001 and uh that was you know, these kids are, you know, six, seven, eight, and they are doing everything I'm doing, and they actually have the nerve to smile, and like, in, in the pediatric wing of, you know, St. Francis, the sixth floor, man, that's where I lived for a long time, and you have that little uh, pediatric center with all the toys and all that, and there'd be kids in there, and they weren't just pretending to have a good time, they were having a blast, you know, they love the nurses. The nurses are, like, walking around with their faces painted because they sat down with the with the kids and, like, they painted each other's faces and stuff like that. I mean, just, like, beautiful things. So, I mean, facing these horrible things and, but, you know, having the nerve to smile like that, those are heroes to me, you know. And a lot of those kids probably grew up and said, you know, well, yeah, I had cancer when I was a kid. Yeah, it sucked. You know, but you know, I was six. I don't. I don't really remember much of it. But I mean, they they would go. I, I mean, they would sit there and have a blast, play hide and seek. I'd I'd play with them, and you know, uh, we'd play a video game together or something. And uh, you know, then like the nurses would come in, all painted up if it was Halloween or, you know, because it just was, <laughs> and uh, you know, or something like that. And then you know, just have the time of their life, and then be like, all right, well, I'm I'm off to take another. You know, another batch of chemotherapy, you know, and then they bunker down and get and get it done, you know. Um, I don't even know how I got on that. But, yeah, basically, like, that was an inspiration to me. Uh, I think that's where I was going with that. <laughs> and uh, so that that's where I want to go with this show. I, I just want you to tell your story. How you give meaning to it is when you go through it, someone else may see it, but if you bottle it up, and you never say anything about it. No one can ever see it. It can't help anyone. And when you tell the story, when you give testimony, when you talk about it, it you have no idea. I mean, you may have a little bit of an idea, but it is so cleansing. It gives it meaning. You know, like I'm sitting here doing this, giving it meaning. I'm, I'm saying that why I went through what I went through is so I could sit here and talk to you guys about it and tell you my story and hope that it helps you out. And I have developed the skills to get through, you know, like my day-to-day -day life and my day-to-day -day thinking and, uh, you know, but maybe someone who's listening to this or someone out there isn't as familiar with it. Maybe they're just, because that, that's where I'm going with that, is that you need to tell your story to someone because they need hope. And when you give hope, you get hope. Like, it, it's, it's just how it works. So, like, when you, when you shine a light at someone, a light is reflected onto you. And it's, that's how we heal ourselves. By saving you, I save myself. Um, and uh, so, yeah, you know, that, that's the whole point of the show is to, is just to, let you guys know that there's hope and there's you know and that there's a reason that we went through it but the reason isn't going to be told to you you give it reason you have to tell other people not why you went through it because that that's the thing is there's it's so it's random to the point where it doesn't i don't i don't think you know it just a bunch of cards go out and they say, okay, well, Johnny's going to get cancer. Uh, Emily's going to get uh, sexually assaulted. And uh, Billy down the street, is he's going to get addicted to drugs. And, 
you know, Cheyenne is going to have suicidal thoughts, you know, it, it's, it's, it's not like that, like, we don't, we don't get to choose the cards we're dealt, but we get to decide how those cards leave our hand, you know, um, we get to decide what we're going to do about it, you know, how we're going to save ourselves, and the best way to do it is just to tell your story, even if no one listens. Like I said, I've the last episode, last I checked, had 12 listeners, which is fine. <laughs> you know, I, I it's not about how many listeners. It's about I want those, maybe those 12 people can sit there and say, huh, well, maybe I need to go tell my story. Just start talking, you know? Like, I mean, that that's kind of, you know, that, that's, that's where I'm going with it is, you know, just tell someone, write it down, you know, get, give it to someone. And, you know, because you're going to see someone. I mean, how many times have you been at work and, you know, you've, when you first got there, you were scared, you were intimidated, but, you know, you really wanted the job to work out. And then before you knew it, a year had gone by now, you know, or like a, a couple weeks go by, we'll say. And you're starting to get the swing of things, and then like a, a couple months go by, and now something just goes off, it clicks in you, and now you really understand the job. And so you stay, stick around there for a year, and then you're now you're really established, you know what's going on, maybe you're even running the place, or at least you know run, have have a couple people underneath you. And then you see the new person come in. And you see the same look in their eye that you had, like that confused, bewildered, like, what the hell am I going to do? What have I gotten myself into? What is this? And you know that feeling and because you did it too. And it may be different, you know. You, you may look at them and roll your eyes because, you know, like, oh, God, I hate new people, you know, because we've all been there, you know. But you may see... You may have like an anxiety disorder or something like that or like a social anxiety or a fear of people even that you can sit there and say that you've worked through, you've come up with the processes and maybe you're even on medications that help you with like antidepressants or anti-anxiety like, you know, myself, I'm on both. And, uh, you know, and now you have the skills to get through it. But, you know, when you look over and you see this person with none of the skills, like my uh, like my friend said, we can have all the skills and the tools in the world, but at the end of the day, it's our own decision. Um, and I'm probably I, I've been saying that a lot lately, and I think I think that it just really spoke volumes to me. And uh, you know, but yeah, you'd look so you'd look over and see this person and be like, dude, they don't have the skills. They don't they don't know what they're doing, and they're so completely overburdened and overwhelmed, and they're they're about to crack. Look at them. And you see them like everyone's passing by and everyone's looking at them like and go and maybe you see a couple of them going, are you all right? And they're just going, yeah, no. Yeah, 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 I'm good. Yeah, I'm good. Now you might be, yeah, my phone's going off. But, and you may notice that. You may smell your own a little bit and want to take them aside and be like, hey, look, I know it's scary. I know it's confusing, but stick with it. Do this. And what, what do you do? You relate to them. You just say, look, when I first started, I was so freaked out and I was so scared. And for some reason, that, that calms us. That says, oh, okay, so I'm not, I'm not a psychopath. I'm not weird. I, I'm not abnormal. You know, like I, I'm actually quite normal. It's, it's the fact that we're all so different that makes us one. You know, it, like it's the fact that none of us are alike that makes us so alike. You know, we all have our own little idiosyncrasies and we all have our own little issues and our own little ways of going about things. And some are better than others and some are very stressful and, and some don't make sense to a lot of people. But at the end of the day, it's just how we process. And that's what, you know, that's all I'm trying to say is that if you just give your story to someone else, it may help them out. So, man. <coughs> oh, excuse me. But, uh, so yeah, you know, that's what the show's about. That's, you know, that, that's my resolve for the whole thing. Uh, you know, sometimes this show's going to be, uh, happy. Sometimes it's not going to be so happy. Uh, 
but I had mentioned before that I am Cody from the Court of Cows. Uh, if you don't know what the Court of Cows is, I'm going to do a little bit of shameless plugging here and say that the Court of Cows is uh, uh, another uh, YouTube channel that me and some guys have where we talk about comics, we talk about toys, we do a lot of unboxings, uh, we do a lot of podcasts uh, that involve uh, usually involves uh, superheroes and uh, DC related stuff. Um, I know we're going to see the new Thor here uh, in a couple days. So looking forward to that, and we're going to be talking about that. Uh, we're going to be talking about a lot of stuff on there, and we've already we've, we've got a load of content on there. Uh, but, you know, one thing we don't have is a, a YouTube.com slash Court of Cows. This is big, long name. So if you go to Facebook.com slash Court of Cows, you can find all of our stuff through there. And you can also, you know, we have a Twitch account at at Court of Cows, I believe, and uh, and an Instagram, which I believe is the same as at Court of Cows. Oh wait, no, the Twitch is something else, and I forgot the title for it. And and uh, but yeah, you'll you'll be able to find a link through there, and uh, you know also through there you can find all the all you know your boy here. You can find all the everyone has cancer stuff. <laughs> so uh, last time we talked about. Uh, me coming home, but I was far, far, far from being out of the woods, and um, really just kind of going into uh, and honestly, like getting diagnosed with cancer and then getting out of the hospital was just the beginning of the fight. You know, you'd think it was at the end, but it, it it's uh, it's not like you know you do your time, come out, and you're good, and then you just re get get acclimated into life. It's get acclimated into life on top of all the stuff you have to do on, you know, as far as taking different kind of medications, going back and forth to the hospital. And, uh, here we go, talking and taking steroids. So, let's go ahead and put 45 minutes on the clock and let's see how much of this we can actually talk about. Turn the fan off so we don't have any background noise. <laughs> But here we go and start. <laughs> so I'm home now. Um, at this point in the story, uh, I'm I'm just working on getting better, uh, and it's not. That's the thing. They don't just say, "Okay, you know." It's it's not like your regular. Obviously, it's not like your garden variety hospital visit, where they say, "Okay, well, you know, you're good and here. You know, take these. Call me in the morning, and um, you know, let me know if you have any side effects, and follow up with your." <laughs> with your family physician and uh it's not like that you come home you still got to take a lot of shots i still have a portacath in my chest uh, so i have this tube sticking out um i have to go to the hospital every monday every monday and uh get this thing flushed get blood work done to make sure i'm still cancer free <laughs> and uh you know if blood uh, if my red blood cells are low, if my platelets are low, get a bag of blood cells, get a bag of platelets, a bag of blah, blah, say that ten times fast, get a bag of platelets, um, and, uh, you know, or if I'm, uh, I think it was, what, I think it was every three weeks I had to get a spinal tap, you know, so, like, uh, I had to, uh, you know, I, I know there's a movie called Spinal Tap, but... <laughs> But uh, but a real spinal tap where um, where you have to lay down, get a needle stuck in the base of your spine, which if if you've listened before, a lot of stuff happened to my spine, um, and they suck out some of the spinal fluid and check it out, and again make sure if there's any cancer cells in it. Um, but you know you're also taking a bunch of medication. Uh, I had this shot that. Uh, my mom had to, every morning, regardless of going to the hospital or not, my mom had to give me this uh, medicine in the port and then flush out the port to make sure, you know, because it's connected to an artery in my heart. So, uh, and it's kind of like an open wound with a tube sticking out of it. So we had to, you know, put medicine in there and then flush it, which is, you know, get get a bunch of saline fluid and get it in there. And like I said, I had, you know, in the freezer, it just looked like a chemistry set in there, like just all these little vials and they were all just medicine. And, you know, we had to like put them in, put them in this pack and microwave it because if it flushed it too cold, it could make you sick. And uh, like it, it's, it was a process, you know, and it was a morning routine. It was a nightly routine. 
uh, all the while I'm trying to get better and get healthier and get stronger, you know, but you don't just drop to 90 pounds and bounce back from it. Um, I'm, uh, you know, you're taking handfuls of pills. Like, uh, I, I remember the methotrexate, which is, you know, chemotherapy, like pill form, uh, methotrexate, you had to take like 18 of them at a time. And there's like these little bitty tablets, you know, and, uh, it looked like you just had a handful of little bitty candy, you know, and you just had to take that. And, but on this, at the same time, you had all these other pills you had, you know, I had one, you know, of course having one of those seven day boxes where like the little cubbies in them and stuff like had those in there, you know, some of them were like teeny tiny pills. Some of them were like big old horse tranquilizer pills. And, uh, yeah, I just got to a point where like my gag reflux, uh, reflex was pretty, pretty astounding. Like it was damn near non-existent, you know, and because now I can, I can take a pill like no problem. It doesn't, you know, I, I don't have to fight it down or anything. Like it's just, I can kind of swallow any kind of pill, which, <laughs> you know, which caused a problem later in life. And, uh. But yeah, and you know, also you know, still throwing up at at random. Like uh, you know, there'd be times where I would just eat too much, and uh, you know, just puke up, or I would eat something that was just a little too spicy, or like the cheese was just a, on whatever I was eating was a little too strong. Um, and I remember, and uh, like if if I threw up too much, which is like three times. <laughs> um, had to go back up to the hospital for the night because my fluids were too low. Because, I mean, you were always, like, borderline, uh, at the time, for me, I was always uh, borderline dehydrated just from, like, ha- how little meat I had on my bones and how little my body was able to sustain water because that's the thing is chemotherapy. It doesn't just kill, I mean, I'm sure we all know this, but it doesn't just kill cancer cells. It's setting off a nuclear bomb inside your body. It kills everything, you know? Like, I mean, after the second time, they told me that, like, I could not, if I was to get sick a third time, I could not go through the the regime that I went through the second time and live. <laughs> like, it would kill me. Like, they'd have to do it a completely other way. And so, I mean, that first time is just flushing your body full of chemotherapy and steroids and all that. But the, that that was the biggest one, man. Like, the... Oh, I'm sorry. I was going to say, like, I, I remember one night, uh, I used to love eating chili dogs. Like, I was a big Sonic the Hedgehog fan. Still am. You know, and uh, that translated as me just really, <clears throat> really liking chili dogs for a while. And uh, I remember when I finally got saucy enough to where I was like, all right, you know, I'm, I'm going to finally eat another chili dog after, like, a year of trying to get better. And I ate it, and it stayed down. It was good. And that night, I was puking my guts out. You know, it was just, you know, couldn't do chili. It was it was too hard on the stomach. And uh, yet threw up twice, so had to go up to the hospital. If my uh, if I had a fever that got up past the double digits, uh, then had to go to the hospital. Like, pretty much anything. If I had a headache that went on too long, had to go up to the hospital. Because I also, you know, chemotherapy is also awful, awful on your liver and kidneys. And like I said, you know, before all this, I was already a bad kid and like drinking and smoking and doing all that. So my kidneys and liver weren't all in that great of condition anyways. Um, you know, so like I had an elevated bilirubin, which I uh, still don't really know like the ins and outs and like the total description of what that means. But uh, it basically means your liver is shot <laughs> and, uh, it, you know, and that your guts are awful, you know. So they've gotten better with time, but, you know, kind of everything does. And uh, but, man, I uh, I hated the steroids. Like that was the one thing that those were just the hardest on me. Like, um after a while, I, you know, starting to get better, still having to go to the hospital every Monday. But, you know, um, at one point, I'm able to, like, kind of go out. And you kind of just take it at baby step, man. Like, you start going out a little bit more because you can actually, like, get down the road. Um, my buddy Christine, <clears throat> Christina, I, I had this, you know, all my friends lived in the neighborhood. But, you know, right before I got sick, 
uh, one of my best friends was this girl named Christina that lived in the neighborhood and she lived just down the block and that was the big hangout spot like everyone chilled at Christina's house it was uh, I just finished Stranger Things and I'm in love with it and that's not the point of the show but <laughs> uh, it was kind of like you know the it was kind of like Will's house it was like kind of everything just kind of went back to Will's house you know and uh like that's where they all kicked it and like that's where most of the story takes place and like the kind of the heart of the story uh that's where me matt you know chris like all of us hung out and uh and i remember finally going back over there and i i didn't just get to walk down there you know i had to take a wheelchair you know so I'm, like, going down there, like, someone's wheeling me down there and got to wheel me all the way back, you know. So you just bless all my friends for, you know, putting up with all that, you know. And, uh, <clears throat> but, you know, as that's going on, you know, like, it, it's, uh, I'm trying to remember, like, the sequence of it. But it's, it was every Monday going to the hospital and it was every, uh, every three weeks, I think you had to go to the hospital and get a round of chemotherapy and then you had to wait for three days for it to flush your system and, and usually it took three days for it to flush your system. But it was every three weeks and uh, you know that you had to go. So you know I would try so hard to not get sick because I didn't want to go up there more than three weeks, you know and uh, but yeah, you you had to I, I just got to the point where I was just going up there like I had my little like uh, my three week bag like I just had video games and like stuff that I always had in that bag and I'd like swap it out you know like if, if a new uh, Batman comic came out or a new like Sonic or Spawn came out I wouldn't read it I would just let them pile up pile up you know and just take all that you know to to uh, to the hospital or I just uh, a lot of the time uh, I didn't like just laying there and reading. I'd, I'd prefer to just lay there and play video games. So, like, I, I would, uh, you know, have a stack of games that I'd be like, all right, I'm going to beat this, I'm going to beat this, then I'm going to beat this. And uh, while I'm at the hospital. And I think it was every... I feel like it was every six weeks I had to do a round of steroids. Oh, God. Okay, I, like I keep kind of touching on it. Here's the thing. Steroids uh, at small doses aren't that bad. I mean, we've all gotten a really bad sinus infection and had to go on a round of steroids. But when you get into like the higher doses of them, that's where I start really respecting women that have had kids and, well, women in general. But... Because you are an emotional roller coaster. Like, you cannot get uh, control of your emotions. Uh, you can't sleep. Your appetite is out of this world. It just made me respect them a lot more, <laughs> you know, for just what they have to, you know, some of the stuff they have to go through that guys don't, you know. But uh, if, if I had to pick anything that, you know, kind of gives me a good idea of uh, being pregnant, it would be steroids. Because, man, if I was slightly happy, I was crying. If I was slightly sad, I was crying. If I was slightly angry, I was crying. Like, no matter what. And then all the while, like, I got to a point where I was, you know, craving just weird foods. I want tater tots. I, I want Sonic tater tots and McDonald's burger and Arby's fries, you know, and uh, and ice cream covering all of it, you know? And then like, as I'm eating all that, I'm like, you know what? I want, I want po potato skins and, you know, and I'd be sitting there eating that and be like, you know, what sounds good as popcorn. Like as I'm eating it, I'm like popcorn, you know? And, uh, but yeah, that, that was a, just a very hard time. And, uh, very, very, uh, like the libido's going nuts at the same time, but you know it, it's it's a uh, it's hard to kind of perform, <laughs> you know, uh, on that stuff. Uh, yeah, so I mean, like your libido's going crazy, but you can't do anything about it. Um, like you're just you're just an emotional roller coaster, and then when you get off of them, like you don't just stop. It, it's like another week before you start just leveling out. And then it hits you all at once. 
And uh, I remember when I started, finally, when I was going back to school, I would still have those, like, uh, every few weeks where I'd have to do a round of steroids. But I'm obviously it wasn't on the high doses that I was, but, like, by the time it was starting to affect me, like, uh, emotionally and all that, I would be done with them. Like, I, I would be, like, not having to take them anymore. But, I, man, I, I wanted everything like I wanted food I wanted to talk to every single girl and and I wanted to cry the entire time and then when I was finally off of it it wasn't like a hey I'm, I'm leveling back out no it was like a, a crash like you wouldn't be able to sleep for a couple days and then suddenly like you could not wake up and then you were just just out of it and just asleep for the whole day you know and then you're back to normal so I mean it was it was just I knew what it was going to do to me. I knew how it was affecting me. But, oh, God, it was so hard to go through. Um, and that honestly, that was the most, that, that was the thing I hated the most out of the whole thing. Um, the second time around is when they told me that I was going to have to take another round of steroids first. Like, the very first thing I was going to have to do is take this, like, high, high dose of steroids like that. I remember bargaining with the doctor and, and just saying, please, God, please, please, please don't. No, I don't want to do steroids. No, no, no. No, no is no. <coughs> and I tried to get out of it like she was just going to be like, all right, you know, I'll, I'll let you slide, you know. But it wasn't about that, you know. And I get that now, but at the time, you just bargain. <sighs> but, yeah, dude, that, that was the hardest time. And, uh yeah, that, I mean, like, because also I was, like, real cognitively there because, I mean, they, they you're alert as heck. And, uh, you know, you're aware of everything. Like, you're you're kind of having to face everything all at once. You, you don't – there's no escape. Uh, you can't fall asleep. You know, you can't take a nap. You can't run from anything. I used to watch uh, – if I watched the wrong commercial, I'd sit there and end up, like, crying my eyes out because I'm like, oh, my God, that's so sad. And what? This cricket commercial. Oh, God. You know, or like this Geico commercial, this lizard's so small and he wants to be noticed by everyone. <laughs> um, God, I remember watching uh, The Incredibles. Yeah, like that, that scene. Violet, put, put a shield around the plane now. Like, I could not watch that without like, oh God, they're all going to die. And Violet, they're asking too much of Violet. And, <laughs> and oh God, a, a poor girl and poor Dash and poor whole family. And oh God, you know, I just. I was an emotional wreck, you know? Um, but, yeah, like, you know, you slowly kind of get back out there, but at the same time, you're kind of having to go through a lot of different medications. And, you know, the, and that that's, that's what I was doing is going through all these um, different medications, but still, like, trying to get back out there. And uh, that really uh, whittled my friends down, too. Uh if you couldn't come over and see me, like, we just didn't have a relationship at that time being. Because, like I said before, I kind of had bigger fish to fry. And I don't mean that in, like, a, uh, no, I'm, I'm doing this now, so I'm not hanging out with you. That's the thing, man, is, like, if that's when you find out who your school friends are and who your real friends are. And uh, I just lost track of a lot of people and i i don't mean that in like again don't mean that in a vindictive way we just lost track of each other we just don't went separate ways i was <clears throat> i was dating this girl before i went in the first time named becca and me and her were like really good together we were very comfortable and very happy and uh and then afterwards it just kind of turned out that it was it was just kind of a high school thing you know like uh we, I think we tried to reconnect afterwards, and I and I just got, you know, it, it just didn't work out. And, uh, you know, but, yeah, and it was just because, like, now it, it just kind of changes the dynamic a little bit. And that's uh, that was another big uh, culture shock that I kind of want to talk about is that when you – I thought I could just get back out there pick up with my friends and like just carry on like it didn't happen be like hey just kind of like I took a detour but we all arrived at the same destination like hey yeah sorry I, I got hung up back there but yeah so what were you talking about but uh, people bonded 
life moved on. Um, how I viewed it for the longest time is I, I used to look at the window in the hospital room and just see life passing by. It just kind of felt like I was, I was you get taken out and you get put in this world that is the hospital. And to tons of people, it's a place of work, but to even more people, it's, it's a cell. It's a, it's a holding cell that you get, they, they tell you you're getting better there, but really you can't leave, you know? I mean, you can, no, no one's holding there, holding you there against your will. Actually, legally, if you say I'm going home, they can't stop you. Um, but I felt like life was carrying on without me and time did not factor into my life. Uh, time and normal normalcy was no longer a part of who I was, you know. So, you know, when I would talk to Jared and he'd say, oh, yeah, I was dating this one girl and, you know, and so-and-so says I was cheating on her, but I wasn't. And, and you know, I talked to Brian's friends, cousins, sister's brother who saw someone do this. And, or, and yeah, like uh, Stacy took it the wrong way because of this. Um, none of that mattered to me. Like, I mean, I wasn't just like, oh, that's so stupid. But it, it, didn't, it didn't affect me like it used to. You know, like, uh, you find out what's really important, you know, when you, when you face your mortality and another big message I want on this show is that you, once you face your own mortality or you face this big thing, what's going to happen is if you give meaning to it, it makes you into the best person, into the best version of you, not the best person you can be. It's not boot. It's not, a. It's not like the military where you go in and they make you a soldier. Like you just come out the other side of it and you are this perfect, not perfect, well, yeah, perfect entity because you're perfectly flawed, beautiful creature. It's the whole larval stage into a butterfly thing. It, it's, a, it's a hard, hard winter. And that's... <laughs> As a matter of fact, like that Christmas, uh, you know, I'm kind of all over the place on this episode, but man, that, that Christmas back home, uh, I got home maybe a, a little into December and we had that horrible, horrible ice storm. It was snowing, it, like everything was iced over, uh, everyone was losing power and they, they sold a lot of backup generators at Walmart and uh a lot of people had backup generators and like big nuclear missile looking heaters and um and that that's just kind of what we what they had to do so i mean and that not even that like affected me because i i lived at the hospital now um it was just it it changed the dynamic of how you looked at everything it changed uh your whole outlook on yourself it changed your personality and I didn't even know who I was, you know, like I, I realized that I, I don't know who I was before this, you know, before being sick. But, I, you know, as far as so as far as I was concerned, I was born in 2001, you know, because I, I didn't. And I tried to make sense of that for the longest time, but I didn't cherish anything like I was just kind of floating through life, you know, and uh, just kind of like floating from one good time to the next good time. And, uh, you know, I, I do kind of wonder uh, in, like, another dimension on Earth 2, Cody, like, uh, that never got cancer. I kind of wonder what that guy would be like. Uh, you know, if he would be a deadbeat or if he would just be... Un- or if he would have just had... I don't know what I would have had, but I guarantee you something else would have happened because it it defined me. It made me it made me the best person I am, uh, or the best version of myself, the man I am today. If I if I didn't have if I would have gotten the life I wanted, then I wouldn't be the person I am today. So, um, but new relationships had started. Uh, their lives had moved on, and I had to reacclimate myself into the group. Um, around this time, you know, we would like, you know, I, I would kind of, I, I would try to go hang out with the guys and, you know, uh, 
everyone looked at me a little bit differently. Everyone looked at me like a Fabergé egg or like the, a newborn. You know, some of some people just didn't know what to do with me. They didn't know how to act around me. Like I, I was either going to, you know, it, that I was going to be broken at any time. If I cleared my throat a little too long, they'd be like, oh, my God, shut off the music, shut off this. Cody, are you okay? And uh, all that. And, uh, you know, so, like, I, I didn't even get treated the same for the longest time. Like, I... I uh, and to this day, I have this real uh, disposition about pity. Like, if anyone, I don't like people asking me if I'm all right. I don't like people like taking moments to like help fix me or like act, basically acting like I'm broken. Because I, I, God, I got that for the longest time. People tiptoeing around me so as not to hurt me. You know, and uh, it made me feel like I, I wasn't a person for the longest time. It made me feel like an infant. It made me feel like a newborn because that's um, that's kind of how I was treated. And uh, I remember it felt like wearing a mask, you know, also because, I, I you know, I would, uh, like I said, I had all those charities, <laughs> you know, uh, for a while and all that money kind of went to me. So like, you know, I would just kind of go out with my mom or, or whatever. And, you know, we'd like go out to the mall and I'd buy like some shirts or something. And, you know, we'd move on. And, uh, I remember I, I was at a point, uh, at one point in my life, I didn't even look at price tags, you know, like I would just grab stuff and go and like, uh, I, and not just saying like, Oh yeah, I was living like a rock star lifestyle again. You know, it was really just like if I was with a friend and they said, oh, I like that. You know, I I had nothing but expendable or disposable income. So, you know, I'd be like, all right, and I'd buy it, you know, or, or you know, just stuff like that. And um, that I, I still actually struggle with that today. I just think I have all this disposable income when I don't. But, uh but yeah, like if if I was while I was at the store, if I was in a wheelchair and like someone looked at me a little too long, I'd be like, "Dude, will this guy please just f off, dude? What are you looking at?" Yes, I'm bald and in a wheelchair, and I look like a skeleton. Like I, it's not making it easier for me for you to sit there and stare. Just move on. Just walk on, dude. You know, walk on home, boy. And uh, but if I saw someone that I knew that didn't recognize me that's when it felt like wearing a mask because some some people would like come up and like sit there and talk to me for a little bit knowing the, and just with this very familiar vibe and then they just look in my eyes too long and then realize who I was <laughs> you know and uh it took people a minute to figure out who I was and that's when I realized I had you know my my entire look had changed but at the same time like even if I had the same look the whole demeanor had changed you know like I I was you know you're not the same person that you are when you go you know when you come back from the fight and uh even if you're still in it um you it just changes you forever and uh but my friends still saw me you know and uh my, my my real friends, my you know, the the true friends in there. And it just kind of went like that for the longest time, you know, like going going to the hospital back and forth, uh, taking steroids when I had to, which was, you know, just a horrible time. And uh, it got easier every day. I got a little bit stronger every day. Um, <laughs> I... I don't know where all my family was at the time, and I, I can't really say like what battles they were going through, because I, I was just trying to get through what I was going through. Uh, a lot of like crazy weird stuff happened. To j- j- I mean, just your body goes through all these crazy changes. Um, my, we're gonna get a little gross. Uh, my skin on my hands and feet were just it was like a lizard like I was just shedding constantly and like I could pull up my foot and like I'd be on my on my hands I used to be able to at one point I could grab at the base of uh 
my between you know my palm and my middle finger and grab like the little bit of skin hanging up there and just pull off like the entire front of my middle finger like a snake skin just like the entire thing would just come right off it would just slough off and uh like and then i would just have this perfect finger like <laughs> just sitting there like uh and my, my feet were the same way like uh i used to hate going in the bathroom because uh one, the mirror was there. Bathrooms were horrible for me. I was like John Travolta in Pulp Fiction, you know, because I would, if I was walking and there was like skin kind of sticking off of my foot, I could feel it, you know, and it would, you know, kind of hurt my foot. foot. So I'd pull it off. But if I pulled it off, it, my, it was new skin under there. So it would be really, really cold. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so that, that would suck. Um... I'm tr- uh, what else can we talk about on here uh, on this specific episode? Because I'm I'm trying to fit in as much as possible from like the you know the newbie, like getting back into life and all that. Um, I remember having a talk with my sister, and asking her just how I treated her before, you know, because sixteen years I had no idea how my sister viewed me, and now suddenly I cared. Um, and she said, well, beforehand, you barely spoke to me, you know, um, and I never meant to, like, not talk to her, but it, mortality, again, mortality does something to you. It, it lets you know what's worth cherishing and, you know, what's really not worth the hassle and what's not worth the concern, um, and I, you know, I can't say what what she was doing with her life. I can't say uh, what my brother was doing with his life. You know, I I just knew that uh, for the longest time, I I was just uh, a lot of people just kind of, like everyone just kind of treated me differently, and I'm I'm sure we can all relate to that. Like everyone just kind of I, I was kind of a social pariah, but I really wasn't a social pariah. Like everyone wanted me around. But I would get so I would get there uh, around the group and everything, and there's been a whole dy- complete paradigm shift, where you know I don't even know what's going on in this group anymore, and like they wanted me around, but I had nothing to add to the conversations. I had nothing that I cared about uh, to tell them, other than being like, "Hey, so yeah, I was at the hospital the other day, and this funny thing happened. I threw up twice. Ha 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 ha." You know, like, it kind of killed the room. (laughs) And, uh, you know, so, I I mean, I tried my best to, you know, uh, be a good person and keep my head up. But, you know, it it didn't always kind of pan out that way. But, you know, you kind of take it one day at a time. And you just kind of keep moving forward. And new relationships would start. New friendships would arise. Uh... Obviously, I wasn't in school, so you know a lot of my time was spent at home, um, and uh, you know just kind of in the neighborhood. And you know, luckily the internet existed now, so you know I, I'd, I'd meet people, I you know, and I'd uh, you know, hang out with some, and uh, you know just take take all the medications and just hope to not catch myself in the hospital. Uh, but yeah, like, uh, all my friends at the time, like my real close friends were those kids, man. Like there was this, uh, there was this boy named Justin, um, that he was one of the coolest kids in the world. He, he was like eight or nine and he was my buddy, man. Like me and him just kind of did everything together while we were there. And, uh, he was just a real fun dude. And, um, one of my closest friends from grade school, I, I you know, I, I was still kind of, you know, hanging out with him and you know uh he he actually moved to chicago and at one point you know like i went to chicago and visited him for a week and you know but i mean that was way later into you know uh the hospital stuff like i had to have the right medications and all that and just be set (laughs) uh but yeah you know it kind of set me up for a life of having to take medications and wanting to take others and uh and that, that's been kind of just a constant struggle throughout my life, you know, even still today, 
you know, because like I said, well, you know, we'll get to it later. But, you know, I relapsed, you know, uh, spoiler alert. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I had to go back in. But th- that, that was a little bit worse. <clears throat> but at this point in my life, uh, at, at well, at the point I was in, it was just uh, taking it one day at a time. And it was just like trying to go forward and trying to rekindle friendships and rekindle relationships but that's the thing is there's no there's no going back you can only go forward like no matter how much you want to go back you can only go forward and uh you know there's no because like once everything happens there's no there's no turning away from it there's no ignoring the fact that certain stuff happened um i want to close this by talking about my dad a little bit uh just cuz you know, when you get cancer and or when you face the thing in your life that's going to change you, some people can handle it and rise to the occasion and some don't. Um, you know, I was a goth kid, uh, but honestly, like I, I wasn't planning on being a goth kid. Like, you know, I've, I've joked about like this is the 90s. So a goth kid was Jinko's black clothing, you know, fingernail polish. uh Black, of course, like just book jet black fingernail polish, drawing, you know, like, oh, you don't know me inside the vampire life and the vampire moon is in the sky. And <clears throat> <coughs> but I remember when I got uh, my first pair of Jinkos, like, I just thought they looked cool, man. Like, I, again, 90s kid, like, I, I still think they look cool. Crap, if I could, I'd wear Jinkos all the time. I don't care what anyone has to say about it. And I don't care how they look. They're freaking comfy. Uh, uh, I thought they were the coolest thing ever. Like, I thought they were just the, you know, just the best clothes anyone could wear. And, uh, you know, but when I got them, my, I, I remember my dad saying, oh, you're wearing a dress. Like, I didn't know I had two daughters. And, like, oh, here comes my other daughter. Started out as a boy and, you know, turned into a you know, an FAG or, you know, just, just something. I mean, very, very Southern Baptist, uh, very, uh, opinionated and hated everything I did. Like that, that's kind of how I felt. Like it, it was just, there was nothing I liked that wouldn't make him like damn near throw up. Uh, <laughs> but we got to a point that, uh, at my house, the living room was kind of like the the main, obviously the main room of the house. So, and that's to say that you could not go to another room of that house. You couldn't go from one room to the other without passing through the living room. And my dad, that that was he had the big dad chair, the recliner, and uh, you know just sat there and watched TV all day. And uh, you know I went to work too, but you know when he was home. That was when it was hard because I would walk by and every single time he'd have to throw out some comment. Oh, here comes my other daughter. You know, is, oh, I like the dress you got on. When's your boyfriend going to be over? Um, you know, is, uh, and just things like that. So I, I, uh, it would, it would hurt. It would, you know, it would bug me a lot. So what I started doing is, uh, you know, I started wearing a bracelet. Uh, it, the hair was starting to grow up because I just I just wanted longer hair. And uh, he was like, oh, wow, you, you really are becoming just a little B word, you know. You know, uh, and I don't remember the exact moment, but I just remember one day uh, a friend of mine, like uh, obviously a female friend of mine, we had made little like best friend bracelets and, you know, wear these forever and all that and it you know it said uh, you know me and I don't remember even who it was but it was like uh, best friends Danielle I think it was Danielle <laughs> uh, but like this old friend of uh, mine um, but yeah it said you know like Danielle on it and uh, I walked through and just tried to like kind of pass it off like, and like just kind of shook the bracelet and just kind of like held my hand over my over the side of my face like you would if you just saw someone you and you don't want them to see you at the bar or something and uh 
he saw the bracelet and he was like, oh God, you're wearing jewelry now too, you know? But then I found out that when he got really mad, he would just do, the, he would like short circuit, <laughs> you know, and he would just do this like, <laughs> but he wouldn't be able to talk. So he gets so angry, but he would not be able to like say anything. So I took that as the fact that if I walk through there, if I need something to drink, I have to build up my self-esteem enough to where I can just walk through the room and just take whatever insult he is going to hit me with because he's going to hit me with one. And uh, and then he's going to hit me with one going there and coming back. So it was either wear, he- wear headphones, you know, so he'd have to be like, hey, can you take those off for long enough for me to talk to you? You just don't even want to talk to me. And I'd take them off and he's like, why, why do you have to dr- wear all that shit? You know, why, why do you got to dress like that? You know, well, I, I didn't, I mean, when am I going to get my son back? You know, just <laughs> stuff like that. And so that didn't work. So, uh, but that one time, man, I walked by with a bracelet and uh, a little bit longer hair and, uh, you know, tucked the hair behind my ear as I was going by and shook my hand. So the bracelet made a noise. He was so angry that he could not speak. So he could not insult me. Like, he could not hit me with a scornful remark because he was too busy just short-circuiting, you know? So I could actually get to the kitchen and back, you know, without him saying anything. He was furious, but I was okay, you know? Like, he just kind of had to deal with it, you know? And, uh, like, me, I, I was just trying to get a drink. Like, I'd love to talk to you on a normal plane, but, like, I'd also love to not be insulted, that's all you do, so, you know, why, why would I try to pet a dog that has rabies, you know? And, uh, and then it just kind of, like, escalated from there. Like, when he, fi- he finally got used to the fact that I had a bracelet on and the hair, and then he would start slinging more stuff my way, so I would throw on another bracelet, and the hair would get a little bit longer, and I'd paint one, uh, like, I'd, uh, you know, get... I used to paint with just a Sharpie, but then I'd just straight up use black nail polish because, you know, if I did it and he saw it, couldn't even speak (laughs) you know so it just kept escalating and escalating and getting bigger and bigger and before long he was always at my right side so uh i had uh there the chair was at the right side on on my right so uh my right hand was covered in like bracelets and like just dark like goth kid jewelry and stuff and then the the left hand wasn't the left hand had like nothing on it (laughs) and uh you know, and then my hair got to a point where it was like down to my chin, shaved on the sides, and I put it up in the top knot. Because I mean, there there was a time that that was actually cool. It wasn't just like a throwback. Uh, it was a time when it was a brand new haircut, and I had one. But I'd take my hair down, man, just so I could walk through the room. And I hated my hair behind my ears because, like, you know, you could feel it and it felt greasy and gross, and uh, you know. But I'd walk through that room, tuck the hair behind the ear, and he hated it like he would get so angry and he would get so furious but and then he just kind of but he kind of developed a strategy of like just coming in the room and uh and just kind of yelling at me for how I looked or something like that or I'd come home and um I don't know if you guys remember Circus Magazine but it was basically just a magazine of all the like new metal and like metal singers. It was just pictures of them. Like that's a couple articles, mainly just pictures of like Cole Chamber and Corn and Slipknot and uh, Limp Biscuit and just all the kind of guy orgy like just Deftones. All the guys that were like big around then, really showing my age with all that. But yeah, I used to you know take those off and put another poster up and then like. Uh, you know, always skip out on Marilyn Manson. I mean, I, I had my rules. Like, none of the people that were, like, anti-God, that like, in their music anyways, like, I didn't know their, like, spiritual beliefs in general, but, you know, if they had pentagrams on them, I, I didn't respect them. Like, because I've, I've always been Christian. I was never about upside-down crosses or anything like that. Just, I just kind of started being more and more goth just to shut my dad up, <laughs> you know, and... um and yeah, that's a goth kid has daddy issues. Big, big surprise there, you know. Uh, but then, you know, I would come home and like one of my posters would be ripped off the wall or, you know, all my posters would be ripped off the wall. 
And, uh, oh, you don't need that, that garbage. Oh, I ripped all that trash down. You know, and if I didn't say anything about it, I just went through the room and sat there. He would come in the room and let me know that it was him. You know, like, oh, I had I pulled all that cr- trash off your wall, you know, because we're, we're not bringing that into this household. Not today, not never. We're not bringing hate and, you know, bad feelings into this household. And that's what you're trying to do. It, yeah, it's not the fact that, you know, I can't walk through the room without you calling me a girl or an FAG or uh, or just something like that. And, you know, um, anything. And he, he was just like that. And uh, he, he very, very, like, verbally abusive. And uh, then I got sick. Changed the entire dynamic. Because I got sick. Now, now he he can't hate me, <laughs> and uh, like you know, you remember on my last episode that like if if you don't like someone and they get sick, and if you try to act like you always had their back when you know in your heart of hearts that you did not, you're just trying to have some, you know good karma on your side if this if anything happens to this person, it should not take a horrible thing to happen for you to realize that this person is valuable and precious and cherished by someone, you know, just, if you don't like him, just hope for the best that someone does. <laughs> Cause someone does, even if someone doesn't, a, their dog or cat likes them. So like th- someone needs them. <laughs> so just leave them be. And if, and that's the, if you come up to them and you let them know that, you know, and come up and act like you were always on their side, that you were always rooting for them, and, like, deep down you always knew they were courageous and all that stuff. Like, that's the thing. The person you're talking to remembers everything that you remember. <laughs> they were there too, buddy. <laughs> you know, like, uh, no, you were not. You were you were not on my side. You've never been on my side. You've, you've always had something horrible to say about me. So you're really just trying to, you just don't want to be the jerk that is saying bad about the cancer kid, uh, is what I felt like. But man, when, um, when I got sick, uh, and I actually came out clean, he wore that like a badge of honor. Like he was telling everyone about like how courageous I was and, and like making up story, like saying that the doctor said I had no chance of living and I stood up and got in the doctor's face and said, I'm going to live through this. That's what I'm going to do. You don't get to tell me how long I'm going to live. And Oh, there's the timer. But yeah, you know, and that, uh, I mean, that that's just chapter one of the relationship with me and my dad because he... Uh, you know, with with that whole thing is now, now he likes me. Now he realizes that uh, maybe you shouldn't spend so much time like disliking stuff that someone else likes. You know, don't dislike someone else's. Don't dislike someone for their favorite things. And if you just don't like them, you know, like don't. That, that's not. That's not a reflection of them. Like, what, whatever, they're, whatever they're into is what they're into. Like, if they don't like the music you're into or the clothing or, like, the, the they don't dress the same, doesn't mean they're a horrible person. I mean, it. you know, what well, Wreck-It Ralph, just because you're a bad guy doesn't mean you're a bad guy, <laughs> you know? Like, <clears throat> but he he acted like, a, you know, captain of the football team. Like, he, he would tell all his friends about me. Um <laughs> I remember at one point, like, he was trying so hard, and uh, he, you know, bless his heart for that, but, you know, like, it, it shouldn't have taken, you know, me about to die for him to realize that, you know, maybe he didn't want me to die, you know, maybe he wanted me to live, and maybe if he would have just, you know just accepted what I was into and not fought me on it, maybe I wouldn't have pushed back so much, you know, because like I said, a lot of the stuff I did was just to dodge, you know, a vindictive thing he was going to say. Like, I was just trying to make him angry because I figured out I could make him angry to the point where he could not even speak. And that was all I could do to avoid these, like, hurtful remarks that would just destroy me on the inside. 
I just had to make him mad enough to where he could not talk. <laughs> You know, and uh, and you know, and then here here we are in a hospital room, and he's, you know, he he's telling me uh, about how all his friends at work are rooting for me, and how you know he he's just so happy that you know like uh, that I'm still there, which I'm sure he is. I'm not taking that away, like I, you know, but it it shouldn't take all that, you know. It shouldn't take uh, just a horrible situation for you to realize what you have. And unfortunately, that's kind of the world we live in. But uh, <laughs> the last little thing I want to say about it is I remember him discovering the band Creed. like, And we all know Creed. You know, they're, they're the archetype for Nickelback. And uh, he heard that they were a rock band. And then, and like, he, I remember him, like, coming up to me and saying... Like, I, I don't even know how he got onto it, but he was like, hey, have you ever heard of the band Creed? And uh, I was like, yeah, yeah, I've heard of them. And, you know, like, with arms wide open and, you know, hello, my friend, we meet a girl, and all that. And and he's sitting there telling me, well, you know, they're, they're, they're a rock band. And did you know that some rock bands are Christians? And some of those people have, like, really good values? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Yes, I do. You know, I'm aware of it. I I don't like Creed. I don't like him any further than I can throw them. And I'm very, very weak at the moment. So, yeah, like, uh, I'm not going to be throwing anything very far, you know. Um, and he said, uh, like, I, I, at the time, it wasn't like Creed, like, as big as they were like he went and got me like a creed cd like he he was all like he thought me and him were just gonna bond over creed for some <laughs> for some reason and uh he it was so it was so stupid and i was just like god you no like uh, get a little bit have have you ever heard slipknot <laughs> you know like what and um uh, but yeah, like uh, I, friends from uh, his work would come visit me, and like people that you know I had never met, you know, and say like, "Hey, I just wanted to say like down at the offices, you know, we're all we're all rooting for you," or like down in the warehouse, you know, we're we're all pulling for you, bud, and, you know, and and I would just be like, "Hey, you know, th- thanks, and you know, thank you so much for the support and all that," and he would just light up, like he he would just he it, he just adored it, you know, and. Uh, you know, so I'm I'm glad I could be like a little badge of honor and like a little trophy for him, but you know I didn't want to be. But still, I I didn't. It's never really treated like a person. Um. And that is kind of where we're gonna leave it. You know, just for the longest time, I I just didn't I I just didn't feel like I was treated like a person. I, I you know like you don't. You don't come out the other side of something and no one immediately says, hey, you're a hero, you're courageous. It takes some time. You know, someone has to reflect on it, especially you. You got to reflect on, you know, what you went through and not give meaning to it, but just say like, dang, I I went through it, didn't I? I I went through some crap. And you just kind of have to like appreciate it and be like, well, I didn't deserve any of it. I, I, you know, I, I, it's not something that I decided to do, but I made do. I, I made it work. You know, it, it's it's my lot to carry, but I didn't have to carry it far. You know, like um, it's just a challenge you have to face. It's, are you going to buckle under the pressure, or are you going to keep going? You know, and it's not saying like you're going to come out as Batman. You're not going to come out as a a superhuman on the other side. I, mean, I I went through a lot of radiation and I didn't come out with superpowers, but uh, I did come out with a very str- a superhuman heart and a superhuman love for uh, a lot of people and a superhuman awareness of what what is right, what is wrong, and what is cherishable and what is not, and whatever issues, problems. Whatever you're going through, just know that you're, you just, all you can do is take it one day at a time. Don't take on the whole project. Because when someone told me that I finally asked the question is, how long is this process of going to the hospital every Monday? How, how long am I going to have to get spinal taps? 
how long am I going to have to get these, uh, you know, because also I had to get, you know, bone marrow fluid taken like once every couple months. How long am I, and the steroids and the chemotherapy and going up every three weeks and staying for three days and then feeling like crap because I just did a round of chemotherapy and like doing, when can I get back to a normal life? And they told me it was two years, two years of this, 365 days times two, (laughs) you know, that I was going to have to go through all of this and just keep going. And I remember thinking, good Lord, that is a long time. How how am I going to get through it? Because you can't do two years in a day, you know, you all you can do is don't look at it as the process you have to go through just let your survival skills kick in and if you want to be angry if that helps get angry about it you know because you deserve more but you get what you decide what you get you know if you think you deserve more then you need to make sure you get exactly how much you're supposed to and no less than that and if you got to do this stuff angry then do it angry but just know that there's so, there's always someone who's had it worse and someone there's always someone on the other side of it. There's people everywhere in all jumps of life. There's little bits of hope. Right this second, there are kids around the world that are in hospitals and, you know, parents that don't know what they're going to do with themselves. You know, Chester Bennington, um, how many people were touched by all that? Uh, that we we had a big tragedy in uh, Las Vegas not too long ago, where the guy just opened fire on these families. I don't know any of the people that got shot or tragically lost their lives, and uh, I didn't. I don't even know the person. I couldn't even tell you the guy's name, what his favorite color was. I you know I don't I don't know any of the names in that crowd, but I guarantee you, there's people that are affected by that. Those were someone's families, you know. Those those that those were all someone's sisters, brothers, aunts, uncles, fathers, mothers, you know, wives, husbands, girlfriends, boyfriends, best friends, just friends, like and they're going to have this horrible time in their life. Can you imagine if we were to reach out to them and say, "Hey, I can't imagine what you've got what you're going through have gone through or what you're about to go through with all this but i know that i am sending you all the love i can and if you want to talk then i'm here to listen and if you want to just sit there and listen then i'll talk so next time what do we want to talk about uh, there, there's so much, but I think, you know, it, it's gotten a, a little bit too uh, messed up. So I, th- I think the next one we're going to talk about, you know, just the glory days of, you know, because there after a few years I was back up and running. Um, I ended up, you know, the, like the goth kid is still living inside my heart. And, uh, you know, now not only do I have all these years, I got through my two years of treatment. It's been 12 years. So it's been a very long time since I was told that, that like, since I looked at something and said, oh, my God, this is going to be the longest two years ever. But once you take it one day at a time and uh, you look back, you're going to figure out how many days you put behind you and this whole thing. And uh, now... I can run like a madman. I could barely walk through a room without getting tired. So you come out the other side. You don't come out clean, but you come out better. I guarantee you will come out better. So uh, one thing that I uh, do like to mention is that, you know, I spend a many, many years and lots and lots of hours on stage uh, doing the whole, doing, not really this, but you know, I, I've always wanted to live behind a microphone. So, uh, I've been the lead singer of a few bands, uh, and I've done quite a few shows. Uh, I've gone on tours. Uh, I got CDs out there, uh, with, with bands that you've never even heard of. And some, you know, never got signed, you know, but lived that rock and roll lifestyle for a very long time. Hey kitty. Uh, my cat just came in the room, but, uh, that's kind of what I want to touch on next is that, you know, in a, in a few years, I would be going back to high school. I would be 
Uh, I would even have my own place, and it was living the punk rock life. I was back to just kicking it. Obviously, it's a bad idea, but throwing back a few cold ones and just hanging out with the guys and just living a very metal lifestyle. (laughs) And uh, being on stage and doing all that stuff. But, you know, that is going to be stories for another time. So, you know what? Let's go ahead and uh, stop you right there and let you know that next time we're going to be talking about all the good times I've had and also talk about the glorious, the wonderful, the legendary, the BA house. (laughs) Yeah, buddy. I'm going to talk about some... Yeah, 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 next time I'm going to talk about some friends and I'm going to talk about uh, you know all, all the friendships I made once I started going back to school and then it's all going to culminate at the BA house and uh, you know and then we'll just go on from there but until then that's my story so far of my battles and my wars I hope my story helps you now go help someone with yours